Hello everyone, <laughs> welcome to Facebook Friday. It is Friday the 21st of August 2020 and it's lovely to be joining you live from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. So my name is Kate Wakelin and um, lots of you know me as the Net Patient Support Nurse. So welcome along to our live broadcast today. Before I go any further, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am broadcasting to you from, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, one of the things I love about where I live is running along the Yarra River, which is in local language called the Birrarung. So um, knowing that you are joining me from all sorts of places from around Australia and even maybe maybe even beyond but just acknowledging traditional owners of all of those places. Um, so just before I can before I sort of launch into our topic of the day just a couple of little updates and things to um, that I've noticed in the Facebook conversations that I thought I'll hop in and address. The first one is there's been some really interesting conversations about carcinoid crisis. Um, so uh, I will post some links in the notes to this video about carcinoid crisis just in case you're watching this and have read along but maybe not have seen the um, preceding conversations and information that we posted about that topic. So it, I mean the short story is that there's a very serious situation that can happen in a small number of people with neuroendocrine cancer in a, so, a small number of circumstances so um, there will be some specific information that I'll make sure I put in the notes about that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was um, we are saying thank you to one of our key and founding consumer advisory group members this week, Jackie Barrow. Um, Jackie, I, you may be watching this and we just wanted to let you know how much we love and appreciate all of your contributions to the consumer advisory group. Um, openings for the consumer advisory group um, are being uh, advertised on um, our website and everything next week and um, so if you are in South Australia um, they're big shoes to fill from Jackie but um, might be worthwhile consider starting to consider whether being part of the consumer advisory group for neuroendocrine cancer Australia might be something that you're interested in. The other vacancy that we've known that we have for um, a little while is from our ta for a Tasmanian representative knowing that our, um, our dear Carol Dugalo um, died a few weeks ago so the opening for that position will also be coming up in the next week or so so keep a look out for our e-newsletter which will um, be at the end of this month um, and also on our website if you're interested and you're from Tasmania or from South Australia. So I I'm feeling nervous today because I'm about to go on holidays for three weeks and I feel like if I don't tell you everything that's on my list today <laughs> the pressure's really on to get it to get it all in so apologies if I look a little bit frazzled because I'm, I'm just a little bit nervous I really want to make sure I tell you all of the things. Um, uh, so just to, um, I wanted to talk about COVID-19. I'm so grateful most of you know that I'm based in Melbourne and um, our numbers for the virus have been really quite scary over the last few weeks and they are finally starting to stabilize and come down so that's making lots of us feel more relieved. Um, I've got a number of close personal friends who have been positive for the virus and have had quite a few um, close encounters with cotton buds and my nose um, so uh, just reaching in, out in solidarity to everybody else who's living um, with the impact of coronavirus whether it's a, you know more of a kind of a, a vague awareness or, or something that's in the background or whether it's much more in the forefront of your mind we know that it's affecting lots of people um, in it, actually probably I would say most people in Australia at the moment. Um, if you are finding that you are being impacted specifically in terms of your neuroendocrine cancer management and coronavirus and we know that there are some people where that is definitely the case we would like you to get in touch with us because we may help we may be able to help advocate for on your behalf for the um, whatever it is that you're finding difficult to access so whether it's people in Tasmania who are um, working out what about treatment um, in Victoria if it's um, if you're waiting for surgery if you're having a financial impact from needing to access scans tests treatments closer to home please get in touch with us and let us know about those things and we may well be able to help you um, so that's what I wanted to say about COSA I'm just ticking off my list today I don't normally have such a structured list but as I said I've got a few things that I really want to talk to you about 
um, the, the next thing, so the, the main thing of our, the main focus for today's talk is actually around depression and neuroendocrine cancers. Now, this is a sensitive subject and um, I know that this is being broadcast out publicly and broadly. What I don't know is how you're going and how you're feeling today. If this is a delicate, if it's a difficult day for you, if you're just having a tough day where the, where the going's tough emotionally, you may choose not to watch the video live and that's absolutely fine. So I have to let you make your own decision about whether you're up for this. It's not gonna be full of doom and gloom and really heavy, but sometimes even talking about it can just be a little bit much on a given day. So please, you know, just take care of yourself. Be mindful of what's gonna be good in your, you know, in your, in your mental diet today. And if you're already having a tough day and you feel like this is gonna be pushing it too much, it's absolutely fine to just switch it off. The video will be here when you come back if you want to watch it at any stage. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to be really upfront is uh, about is um, if you're suffering from emotional distress, sometimes that can, when it gets really severe, lead to thoughts around harming yourself or even suicide. And we want to make sure that if that's you, that you're cared for in a really appropriate and safe way. The best way to do that, I'm going to give these numbers at the start and then I'm going to repeat them at the end and they're also going to be in the notes and they're relevant for people in Australia but I know that in the country that you're watching this from there'll be an, an equivalent service for you. So in Australia, some three really important numbers for you to know about. The first one is um, uh, 13 11 14 which is Lifeline. Now Lifeline is a 24-hour service accessible for free of it's toll free around Australia and it's um, to if you're having concerns about your own mental health that's really the, a very important place to start. I would encourage you all to write that down so it's 13 11 14 the other number which is really useful is Beyond Blue and that's specifically around anxiety and depression. Um, the number for Beyond Blue is 1300 224 636. So that's 1300 224 636. The third number, um, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more at the end of the video, but the Cancer Council um, phone line which is 13 11 20. So that's 13 11 20. 20. And that's a really important one to hang on to, especially as we know that I'm going just about to leave for three weeks holiday. Um, and so if this is leaving you with lingering, uh, you know, thoughts and worries about your own situation in relation to your tumours, that's a fantastic um general cancer information and support service. It's staffed by health professionals. I know lots of them. Um, they know that I'm going on leave. So if you were to call them, they may not know the specific information about neuroendocrine tumours, but they are fantastic just to be able to talk through and make a bit of a plan about what needs to happen from there. So those three numbers, as I said, I'll repeat them at the end. But really importantly for your situation and your management I'm going to be talking a bit about medications today but this all has to go back to your doctor so please don't take what I say as gospel I'm not a doctor I'm a, I'm a neuroendocrine cancer nurse um, I've got a grad dip in psycho oncology but I do not prescribe medications and I can't give you medical advice as such so please um, so important with this as, a, as it is with every aspect of your health and your management to talk with your own team. And it's important. This is part of your management. And I guess that's, you know, the thing I wanted to say up front with depression is that a lot of people think, oh, well, it, you know, it's part of the part, it's part and parcel. It's part of the part of the package that I would feel depressed. And so I've just got to put up with this. So I just really encourage you to say, no, this can be managed. Um, and there's really good evidence to support lots of things in the management of depression in neuroendocrine cancer. So I'm going to talk about those things and hopefully by the end of our chat today you might feel a bit more reassured that if you're struggling with these things there may be a pathway through it to help you feel like it's more manageable and easier and that life has a bit more enjoyment and pleasure in it um, because nobody wants to feel depressed. It's a horrible place to be. So I guess the, and the other thing is uh, importantly leading to this has been some important work with COSA which is the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia 
Um, with the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, it's a multidisciplinary um, organisation. So it's nurses, it's doctors, it's um, exercise physiologists, it's dietitians, it's it's everybody who you would find in a multidisciplinary team in a big organisation that's focused around cancer. There is a special interest group for neuroendocrine tumours with COSA. And so if you're seeing an oncologist, you can ask them, are you part of the neuroendocrine tumour specialist interest group? Um, and we would hope that the answer would be yes. If they say no, then maybe you could follow up with a question. Well, maybe you should. Maybe maybe it's worthwhile having a look at that. One of the pieces of work, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be um, on the executive team of that special interest group as a nurse representative. One of the pieces of work that we have been um, working towards is updating the clinical practice guidelines for neuroendocrine tumours, for the management of neuroendocrine tumours in Australia. These guidelines were first written in 2010. That's quite a long time ago, so you could imagine that these do need updating. And one of the things about the guidelines was the original version, rightly so, back at that time, were very much focused on how do we get these tumours to shrink? How do we actually medically treat this disease? And those things are still very, very, very important. I'm sure you would all agree with me. However, there was very little in there about living with NETS and um, specifically around the topic of supportive care. So helping people manage their diet, helping people make appropriate decisions about exercise and providing guidance about safe exercise with neuroendocrine tumours. And what I'm getting to is psychosocial management. And that's the, you know, managing things like anxiety and depression when the person has a neuroendocrine tumour. So I'm really delighted that um, I've been helping to form a chapter on supportive care, which is covering all those topics. It's going to be a health professional um, focused piece of work so it's a it's a document it's a large document that will be accessible for health professionals who are looking for guidance about managing all aspects of neuroendocrine tumors as including supportive care but it will also be available publicly so you as people who are living having been impacted directly by this tumor either either as a patient or as a family member carer friend supporter you can also read these guidelines and part of what we will be doing is producing a consumer guide like a, a lay summary um, with all of the chapters in this so there's things like you know um, radionuclide therapy or chemotherapy or imaging but you know importantly supportive care so Gosh, that's a long way of saying that in the pipeline, and actually we're, we're fairly advanced in the drafts of, of the supportive care chapter for this. We're working on some uh, written guidance with references, you know, that summarises the evidence around the management of all aspects of neuroendocrine cancers. And we're hoping really, I don't want to, I don't want to um, jinx ourselves because it's been a busy year for, there's lots of people who are part of this team writing all of the chapters, but certainly from a supportive care aspect, we're hoping that it'll be ready to publish before the end of the year. So the, the, the stuff that I'm talking about today about depression is very much drawn from that research that we've been doing and the work that we've been doing to pull that section of the guidelines together. And I've been working with a fantastic psychiatrist, um, Professor Jane Turner, who is based in Brisbane. Um, I will put a link in the notes. She actually spoke at our Brisbane Patient Forum last year in 2019, and that was a very popular um, segment to that forum. So I was, I'll, I'll pop a link to the film from the film segment from that forum in the notes as well but Jane and I have been writing she's been you know she's done the lion's share of the work in pulling together the the psychosocial chapter so that's very much what this is based on so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the difference is between depression and what we would consider to be a normal response a normal emotional response to a really difficult situation you know whether it's sadness or you know any and I spoke about grief a couple of weeks ago maybe I'll stick a link to that video in as well this is going to be a very linky lot of notes um, so what's you know obviously if you're diagnosed with a with a serious illness there is going to be a, a normal level of emotional response to that um, that might not necessarily be classed as depression and actually a lot of that you know within its normal range we we know that it's going to take some time excuse me some time to adjust to that but it is part of the normal response um, but what we know is that for some people and actually in cancer it's a significant number of people so up to 20 percent maybe in some estimates or even more than that of people with any sort of cancer will de develop what we know as clinical depression 
and that's when the emotional response sort of turns slides into like a chronic depressive state and we know that that needs specific management we don't pat people on the hand and go well they're there of course you're going to feel depressed when someone has clinical depression and I guess it's important to know how to distinguish the two from each other and often you'll need a health professional to help you guide help guide you through that um, because when you're in that when you're in that state it's often really difficult to disentangle and think through well is it this or is it that so um, once again I'm going to be continuing to recommend that you talk with your doctor um, with your social worker with your psychologist if you've got one, someone from your team about your situation but some of the key I guess the key little red flags for me when I'm talking to someone that um, is feeling low in their mood that might make me wonder if they're feeling depressed as opposed to what we would consider a normal sadness response from a difficult situation um, loss of pleasure is a key one so if you think about it even if you're going through something tough there are things in your life often that will like they're surefire ways of bringing about pleasure whether it's you know your favorite food or whether it's having a bubble bath or whether it's you know there's a movie or a television show that you know that you can lose yourself in you know so for some that'll be you know real reality tv for other people it'll be the west wing or some people i know it's faulty towers there will be things in your life that would normally bring you pleasure sometimes it's actually looking at photos of your grandchildren or thinking about how you met your, your partner in life or you know funny anecdotes from when your kids were small if you've had kids so most of us have things in life that we know are, are kind of what things that we can return to mentally that bring us pleasure if you're finding that a lot of the time actually most of the time and most of the days that's gone that's definitely a red flag for us in terms of wondering about whether there's depression at play some of the other things and again I'm talking about most of the time most of the day so all of us have days even when you're not dealing with cancer most of we we'll all have days where we're down we'll all have more moments where we think oh gosh is this really you know what life's about it's gee but it's about when it's really um putting a putting a cloud over the, almost your entire existence um some other triggers for me about worrying about someone's mental health are when they're relying more and more on things like alcohol and drugs also when there's sleep disturbance so either that might be difficulty getting to sleep waking up numerous times in the night still feeling exhausted when you wake up and we know fatigue can be a, a common thing with cancer that's not depression so this is in you know we look at all of these things in relation to each other but sometimes sleeping too much so just feeling like you just always want to be asleep um, and, and I guess um, probably the biggest trigger for us is if someone starts feeling, you know, having thoughts arrive in their head around um, harming themselves and sometimes people do start to think about what it might be like to take themselves out of the picture and that makes us feel very worried. That is definitely something that we need you to seek urgent medical care for so that's not something to muck around and wait till you feel better next week about if you're having thoughts like that look they're relatively common actually but it's so important to speak to a professional about your situation so we can work out whether we need to be worried about you because you know um that as i said that can be very very serious so i guess um one of the tools about determining the difference between um depression and like the normal response to having cancer or a normal level of anxiety or sadness given the fact that you're going through something something difficult beyond blue actually have a like an online quiz which i'll post in the notes um and it gives you a number of questions that you go ahead and answer it's actually quite a good quiz i had a look at it before i hopped online today um and it will give you i guess some indication of how worried they are based on the answers to those questions so if you not ready to call an information line but you're maybe worried about your own situation or the way you're feeling that's another thing you can do and they will recommend that you know they'll give you some resources as well so fantastic resources online at beyond blue for you with nets we know there are some things that will contribute to an emotional response that's probably a little bit above and beyond other cancers and i wanted to talk about those factors now so 
um, you know, I said earlier that, you know, we've got the stat of around 20%, up to 20%, maybe even more people with any sort of cancer who are more prone or will develop um, depression. With net says some specific things that can really weigh into that. And the first thing I think is that it's a really uncommon, it's an uncommon cancer that lots of people haven't heard of. So we know that lots of people with NETS have had a delay leading up to their diagnosis. Um, they might be talking with a doctor who doesn't know a great deal about NETS and, and that can lead to feelings of isolation and kind of almost like disenfranchi feeling disenfranchised within medical team. Um, uh, you can feel people with NETS often feel a bit forgotten um, and it's difficult to navigate information about something uncommon which is why we've put so much energy I guess into providing um, resources information resources because we know if it's an uncommon cancer just getting your head around the basic built information will help with reducing that anxiety and depression the other thing about nets is that the tumors not in everybody but in a significant number of people these tumors produce hormones that can result in anxiety so um, and depression so the direct impact of tumors that are producing hormones can then lead to changes in your mood now we don't have a lot of evidence around the impact of treatments on that but anecdotally I also talk to people who find that their mood fluctuates with their with the monthly injections so the somatostatin analog injections and other treatments and it's hard to sort of disentangle that you know whether someone's you know started on an injection and they've recently found out they've got cancer their mood's going up and down um, you know we don't have evidence to say that it's directly related to the medication so please don't worry if you've been prescribed those medications it's not that we um, have evidence to say that they're going to make you depressed but um, some people do notice that their moods sort of ebb and flow in relation to those injections the other thing and this is again very anecdotally but um, people have told me that they feel like they get fluctuations in their mood in relation to their feminine or their um, masculine hormones so ladies will often tell me if they are premenopausal that the um, they'll notice a change in premenstrual syndrome and and feeling really moody before a period so and and neuroendocrine tumors and their treatment affect your entire neuroendocrine system so it's not outside the realm of possibility that this is playing into it we just don't have a lot of research into it but again, and again again anecdotally this is what i hear on the net nurse line the other thing that i think is just really important to mention about neuroendocrine tumors and um, depression is that there is a vitamin deficiency syndrome that can happen in nets it's actually relatively common in nets compared to the general population and it's the deficiency in vitamin b3 now when someone has a neuroendocrine tumor that's producing too much hormone and i've talked about this in other talks but if it's producing too much hormone that can result in the depletion of the body's stores of vitamin b3 and a lot of people with neuroendocrine tumors that get the carcinoid syndrome will have a vitamin b3 deficiency and that can lead to depression so this is a multifactorial situation as you can see it's not just that you've been told bad news and that you've got to kind of get yourself sorted out for a whole heap of treatment and you know the whole impact of it on your life but actually there are, there are physical things that are going on that might be playing into this as well so we've got to be thinking really broadly about this and when it's physical things that could be impacting on depression we often need again you to be talking with your your treatment team have a chat with your doctor about whether you need to be on a vitamin b3 supplement have a talk to your dietitian have a talk to me when i'm in the office which is not in the next three weeks but certainly when i get back from leave um, to see about well maybe there are things that we need to correct from a medical point of view before we even start thinking about things like counseling and antidepressants and things like that so we've talked about i guess the difference between depression and what we would consider normal sadness and we've talked a bit about some of those contributing factors about it being a really uncommon cancer and the sense of isolation not only in terms of the medical team but also socially family and friends they've often never heard of this sort of cancer there's not someone down the road who's had the same sort of cancer um, a lot of people tell me it's a bit like trying to you know landing in a new a new country trying to learn a new language while simultaneously trying to navigate the public transport system so it can be emotionally overwhelming so I wanted to talk a bit about um, 
uh, oh, so the question, and I'm looking at the feed, so um, my eyes will be darting off to the side every now and again. So I just noticed that someone asked about vitamin D deficiency common related, commonly related to nets. That's a really good question from that person. Sometimes when a person has a neuroendocrine tumour, the, um, the absorption of fat in your diet can be impaired, and that can, also, that can be because of the, the tumour or because of the tumour treatment, for example, surgery, or it might be because of a somatostatin analogue, which can, um, in some people, impair the absorption of fats. If that's the case, then you can have a vitamin D deficiency. Also, in winter, anywhere south of, you know, <laughs> certainly Melbourne, a lot of people have a vitamin D deficiency. And that can, yeah, the, that is known to reduce mood. So again, it's a that's a blood test. Vitamin B3 is not a blood test, and I kind of talked about that in other videos but um, vitamin B uh, vitamin D is a blood test so you know certainly if you're feeling low talk to your doctor get them to do a general like a you know a general health check blood test including vitamin D levels um, that may well be um, you know part of the so solution for some people um, so I wanted to talk about some of the non-drug things that we know help in depression knowing that if the depression is is significant then we might need to also talk about medical management or drug management but i wanted to start with some of the things that we know there's evidence around um, for people in managing this that you may well be able to put into your own life now um, in managing this that don't require a doctor's prescription um, certainly there's really good evidence around the role of diet around the role of exercise and then lifestyle things like relaxation yoga um, you know, it'll be different things for different people in terms of those other things. Sometimes people find things like hypnotherapy or acupuncture really helpful. So with this, it's, we, we really want to be taking a holistic, um, a holistic approach. Um, but eating well, getting outside, getting some sunshine on your skin if it's not the middle of summer and, you know, we don't want you to get sunburned, but certainly having some fresh air, some light on your skin, getting your blood pumping around your body, we know that will help with mood um, for people. Um, getting support is so important and, and actually we know that for people with a, like a milder depression, peer support can be incredibly powerful in helping people manage that. So that's things like the Facebook private discussion group who I'm talking to at the moment. It may be something like the Cancer Connect program where we link you one on one with a, someone, a volunteer over the phone to talk about your situation with someone who's been through it and who is there to support you through your situation. It might be through a face-to-face -face support group or all of our face-to-face -face support groups are Zooms at the moment but um, you know we will return to that um, and if you can then that's great if that's net specific but sometimes it doesn't matter where the cancer started or the sort of cancer it's actually just about talking with people who get some of it if not all of it because you know nets we know are really different from each other but it's about finding common ground and common issues and just Knowing that you're not the only one going through this and hearing everyone's tips and strategies along the way can be just so helpful. The other thing that can be really helpful, and I see this in this um, group all the time, is stuff like humour. And I guess, you know, in our group we, we see lots of black humour, we see lots of poo humour, we see lots of rainbow unicorn fart humour. And, and it's like, bring it on because laughing can be so helpful Um in, in helping to lift that mood, even if it's just for a moment, to give yourself a mental break, I guess, from the from the intensity of thinking about the difficult things all the time. So now I know that in significant depression, in severe depression, it's going to be really difficult. And so what I want to say is that these things will be more helpful in milder cases of depression, but sometimes also as an adjunct to medication if your depression is quite considerable and needs medication. So if you're on antidepressants, we also need to be doing all of these other things as well. And sometimes going on to the antidepressants will then eventually give you enough wind in your sails that you can start thinking about eating well, you can start thinking about exercising, you can start engaging and creating habits around um, relaxation, working what works for you, um, engaging in support. Um, the other thing that's really important to note is there's very strong evidence around the role of um, counselling and especially psychology 
in managing depression and cancer. So there's a particular technique called cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy. And because that's a, a relatively structured psychological approach, they've been able to do some clinical trials on that technique. It's not to say other approaches from counselors and psychologists don't work. It's just that we've got good evidence around cognitive behavioral therapy. That's called CBT for short. Um, so we've got some good evidence around that. And with your um, GP can can if you're in Australia you can actually go and visit your GP and um, go and ask for a mental health care plan and that will then entitle you to free at uh, 10 visits and and um, that will cover some of the cost so if you're seeing a private psychologist there may be an out-of-pocket gap with that consultation and it's really important that you ask that ahead of time because the other thing that creates this sort of trouble in nets is financial toxicity so if you're going to go and see a psychologist um, the one that you've been referred to or the one whose name you've got you know is going to charge you a lot of money on top of that rebate then you know there may be some other options that will be lower cost for you um, so shop around have a look um, have a talk amongst the group about who they're seeing who's particularly helpful I know one of the comments before when I posted I was going to talk about this topic was you know a person who said oh I'm seeing a psychologist but I've had to teach them about nets and it's like gosh this is why it's hard isn't it because you know so many of the health professionals who we say go and talk to they might not know all of these ins and outs about how nets affect um, depression so you know it's uh, um, openly saying it's really tricky it's really tough and there's good reasons that people struggle so we want to make sure that we give you all of the tools that we possibly can to put in your toolkit to get through this and to get through this together part of that is sharing information with and support with each other so I guess we know that some of that supportive care, the lifestyle stuff, the diet, exercise, peer support, seeing a psychologist, having some counselling, that can all be really useful. And for some people with depression related to their neuroendocrine tumour, that might be enough to get them on their way. But for some people we know when to when depression has become quite you know when it's been long standing or when it's severe we do need to think about medications and in people with neuroendocrine tumors that makes people the patients but also the medical fraternity really nervous because we're talking about tumors that often produce hormones and hormone tumors and so the the worry is that with a lot of antidepressants interact with the hormone systems in the body and the worry for a lot of people is gosh we don't want to make anything worse by giving you this drug so um, one of the common fallacies that I want to address is that serotonin does not feed tumors so tumors can often produce serotonin and other hormones indeed but um, taking a medicine that interacts with those hormones doesn't make a tumor grow more quickly and that's something that people worry about they've they've rung me and asked me about and saying my doctor wants to put me on a serotonin affecting antidepressant I'm worried that's going to make my tumor grow more quickly and there is no evidence um, to say that's the case so that's the first thing that I really want to get clear the second thing is that um, in your endocrine tumors and we've looked really extensively at the research um, it, it it's actually seems that people may be more worried about making the syndrome with neuroendocrine tumors, so carcinoid syndrome and other hormonal syndromes, um, people sometimes, we think people are actually probably more worried about that than they need to be. So when we looked at all of the, the studies that we could find, the good quality studies that we could find, there was very few um, uh, reports of anyone having any exacerbation or worsening in their carcinoid syndrome symptoms as a result of going on to um, antidepressants that interact with those systems. So actually the conclusion that um, Professor Jane Turner and myself and, and others have come to is that actually they're relatively safe. They're a safe drug to be considering for someone with a neuroendocrine tumour. Now once again I have to direct you to your own health, health professional. There may be things in your situation that are different to the general situation that I'm talking about. Um, but um, I'm really happy to, you know, if, if, if you're seeing a doctor who is, you know, considering a particular drug and I've got, you know, someone in the feed has um, given me the name of a drug randomly, which I've never heard of, but, but if, if they're worried, we can definitely put them in touch with the, the, the literature, the evidence in this area so that the doctor can feel more confident in prescribing and you can feel more pr confident in accepting that recommendation. Um, so we know that in general, um, antidepressants are no less safe than for anybody else um, when they've got a neuroendocrine tumour. 
the important thing is that they can take up to six weeks to work so a lot of people when they're prescribed antidepressants they think oh why am I feeling better and they've been on them for two or three days it's and it's so hard waiting for that fog to lift because when you're living with depression it's it's like every day is so long everything drags and um and so it's really important that you know that it can take a number of weeks for that to really start to kick in so don't expect it to feel better straight away the other thing that i would say which is very important is if your doctor has prescribed antidepressants and you don't feel well on them or you don't feel like they're working please see if you can try and avoid coming off them yourself and the reason for that is that some antidepressants can actually be very unsafe if they're withdrawn suddenly so they can make you physically ill because they're um the you know parts of the body will sort of get used to those and um, antidepressants being there in your system and if it's suddenly withdrawn the body's got to try and kick in and remember how to to function without them and it, so it can be medically unsafe and i've seen people hospitalized because they've just sort of decided oh look what's the point i'm not going to take these drugs anymore or they're not making i don't feel well on them so i'm going to stop taking them and actually then they get really sick the other thing that we get concerned about with people who come off their antidepressants early is that sometimes we worry that that depression might come back and be more severe but also maybe more difficult to manage long term if you've already been on antidepressants and you've only been on, on them for a very short period of time without swapping onto something else that's working better for you so please I, I can't stress this enough I know I'm sounding like a broken record but talk with your doctor about it and sometimes the the drug will be a, a short acting one that will be fine to come off if, if that's the decision that you both make but don't do it without medical advice that's the the really important thing um, there are side effects with all medications except for maybe Panadol but even that can you know for some people they're, they're sensitive to that but um, antidepressants you know they change the body's chemistry so there are side effects and really importantly if if after you know a few weeks in talking with your doctor it's not working so well for you or you're getting side effects in, and someone did send me a private message this morning saying you know the, the doctor has put them on a, a, an antidepressant that they feel is going to be safer from a hormone point of view but they've got horrible side effects and they're wondering if it's really even worth it it's you can so, certainly switch over so don't feel like well there's only one you know antidepressants there are antidepressants there are antidepressants there's lots of different sorts um what it's not a one size fits all so the you know the dosage will be different from, from person to person and the what will work for one person might be completely different from what will work for another person so you've got to keep coming back to your doctor and tweaking it and talking with them making sure they know if you've got nasty side effects um we might be able to manage the side effects or maybe it's a, a reason to think about a different you know trying something different to see if that works better for you so i just want to look over my notes and make sure that i've covered off the things that i wanted to cover it's really like this is such i mean i know i've been talking for ages but it's it's a look you know um my only the i only did a graduate diploma and that was two years the doctors who are you know psychiatrists have studied for years and years and years to know all about this stuff it's a really complex field and there's no way i can encapsulate it in a you know 20 minute um video um via social media so uh, you know please don't treat this as the you know the a to z of anti of depression and your endocrine tumors it's really just i guess some some key points that have stood out to me in working with people over many years with my background um i'm going to talk about i'm just going to go back to the services for you if this talk has raised issues for you or you're feeling low today there's there's three numbers or there's two particular numbers if you're feeling low and then I'll talk about the cancer council a bit more in a moment but lifeline so especially if you're feeling like you know thoughts of self-harm or um, ending your life are there for you please don't panic about that but you need help it's so important um, so the phone number for lifeline is 13 11 14 so important it's in Australia it's toll free Beyond Blue is the other number, which is really useful to to to, to call. Um, and they've also got a fantastic website, as I mentioned earlier. I'll make sure that's in the notes. But Beyond Blue's phone number is thirteen hundred two two four six three six. So that's thirteen hundred two two four six three six. So look, I hope that's helped. I'm going to have a very quick look through the notes and people have actually been talking a bit about some of the things that they have found useful, which is great. Um, 
as I said earlier, peer support's really key. So use this group, you know, use your networks. Um, just because everything, all the face-to-face -face stuff is, is gone online, I know it's not the same as being in the same room as people, but there's still lots of ways that you can access the expertise and experience and support and empathy and warmth and poo humour, um, <laughs> if that's what rocking your boat, um, you know, through the online network. So please do um, avail yourself of that. So... Some of you may have heard that I'm about to go on holidays for three weeks. Now, I never have taken three weeks off in a row um, since I've been working in this kind of area. So it's really unusual for me. Um, but my clinical supervisor has read me the right act and said, Kate, you need to take a holiday. And I'm like, oh, okay, she's boss at the moment. So I am taking a three-week break or a three, and a three and a bit week break. I'm returning to the office on um, Wednesday the 16th of September. So I know that feels quite a way away. Um, uh, so there's a few things for you to know about how we want you to help, you know, keep well and keep on, keep afloat um, in terms of information and support over that three and a bit weeks. So the first thing is that um, we have been in touch with the Cancer Council 131120 line staff um, in every state and though the the health professionals who run those lines it's a separate unit in each state but they all know that Kate's going on a holiday so there's been like a general announcement to the world that Kate's going on holidays for three weeks so they may they know that they may get more calls from people with neuroendocrine cancers during that time now not every nurse or health professional on that line will have a background in neuroendocrine cancers but we've been working fairly hard to upskill them so they may actually know more than you give them credit for but importantly for general information and support they're your first port of call so their number again is 13 11 20 tell them kate's on holidays she said to ring be nice to them they'll probably feel nervous um and and sometimes that can be a really good thing just in terms of surviving that gap until i get back um if you have pressing concerns that are related to, I guess, neuroendocrine cancer Australia or are specific to your treatment, and I'm thinking um, especially around COVID-19, if you're having trouble accessing um, scans, tests, treatments, you know, you need to get in touch with us from an advocacy point of view or, you know, um, anything else that's more administrative. There will be a phone number on my out of office on my email and um, and also on my voicemail um, as well as some of our social media posts. I'm not going to say that number out loud because this is going onto YouTube and um, it'll be out there forever if I do that but um, it will certainly be um, available if you email me or if you ring me that number will be certainly there for you to get in touch with us. Um, we've got a, a fabulous um, project officer called Meredith Cummins who has made a Herself, generously made herself very available for that purpose so we're very appreciative and knowing that the neuroendocrine cancer team is tiny um, where you know we we um, you know I'm very grateful to my entire team for enabling this holiday for me during a what is a really busy year so um, so 13 11 20 for pressing concerns Meredith is your is your woman and you, I've given you information about how to get in touch with her um, I just would say, uh, just a, a general note, and this is more for people who are in our Facebook group, so if you're watching this via YouTube, you might find that this is becoming less interesting for you. Feel free to, you know, go and make yourself a cuppa and run a bubble bath or something. Um, but for particularly in our Facebook groups, um, we have volunteer moderators and they are the most amazing individuals so in our main facebook private discussion group we've got denise and katie in our carers support group we've got sylvie and a newbie whose name is mel who i'll be hopping into the group this afternoon to say hooray we've got another volunteer moderator in that group and our wa or not our wa but the wa net group also runs with volunteers moderators now often i'm a bit of a resource person for those people those volunteers um you know so if there's tricky questions that come up or you know things that they don't know the answers to they'll often get in touch with me and they won't have me over the next three weeks they are able to contact um, Meredith if they need to but um, I would just ask you to all take just keep an extra look out for you for each other this next three and a half weeks um, you know make the moderators job really easy by you know posting lots of wonderful supportive comments 
if just have housekeeping though if you're inviting someone into any of the Facebook groups make sure you send a message to the moderators to the admin people to say I'm inviting this person into the groups because it's really easy for people to do that accidentally and accidentally invite someone that they didn't mean to invite to the group spaces so send a message to um, and the admin uh, you can see that by looking at the about group section and the, the admins are listed there if you send me a private message, I can't put it out of office on my private message. Please don't send me private messages anyway because I just don't see them. They just get lost. Email is great. If you want to get in touch with me for after I get back from leave, so if you want to just you know, put your name in, a, in the queue for me to get back in touch with, I'm really happy to do that. But email is definitely the way to go. It's just much easier for me to keep track of all of that. Um, so... Uh, 0408 827 oh I beg your pardon there we go that's my brain clocking out for the day um net nurse at neuroendocrine.org.au so that's net nurse at neuroendocrine.org.au and I think my brain has just very clearly told us all that it's time for Kate to um to finish up for the day and looking at the time I can see um, that you've all been listening for a really amazing amount of time too so I'm going to sign off I'm going to wish you all the best for the next three and a bit weeks I I'm really looking forward to seeing how you all go. I can't wait to come and check in and ch you know see how you all are. But um, so wonderful to spend this time with you today. One other thing, I was oh, I'm glad I remembered to mention this. Simone Layden, who is our CEO, will be hopping in for the next three Fridays to um, do the Facebook Friday broadcast. I know that you're going to be extremely gentle with her. She's not done this kind of thing very much before. Um, so we've done a little bit of, you know, tutorials to, you know, get her up to speed. Um, she's got some really interesting things planned to talk with you about and we've been workshopping some of that stuff too. So I'm looking forward to catching up on those videos when I get back. But yeah, keep a look out. Facebook Friday is still happening, even though Kate's going on holidays. Um, you'll get to spend a bit more time with Simone, um, which I think is going to be really fantastic. So anyway, that's enough from me. I'm going to sign off. Have a fabulous three and a bit weeks and um, yeah, take care of each other, everybody. Bye-bye.